Hey, welcome back, folks. I am John Nigerian, and I am delighted to have the one and only Zuby uh, on the broadcast with me today. Uh, Zuby is a gentleman um, who's, uh, and I told him before the broadcast started, we're like brothers separated at birth. I mean, he has lived all over the world, really. Uh, Saudi Arabia, UK, he's a Nigerian, I'm a Nigerian, and everybody in my high school, Zuby, used to say I was Nigerian. I didn't <laughs> quite get that, but now I do. <laughs> and uh, um, Zuby also favors the, uh, the clean shaven head look like me. Mm. Um, although I end up covering it up a lot, Zuby, just like you are right now. <laughs> uh, we both work out a lot. Um, he's actually had some success in writing books about strength training and uh, the benefits of working out, uh, which is one of the things that initially got me following Zuby was um, he's a bon vivant. He loves living life. Um, he doesn't take crap from anybody. <laughs> Again, <laughs> another, another thing we've got in common, Zuby. <laughs> and then when I started retweeting Zuby, um, and by the way, his handle on Twitter even though I'm sure most of you already have it, is at Zuby Music, Z-U-B-Y-M-U-S-I-C. Um, and his following on Twitter has just exploded as I was seeing some of his really insightful tweets, like for many of you, I have retweeted him then. And as I did that, um, a friend of mine at CNBC reached out to me and said, John, do you know Zuby? <laughs> and that friend was Wilford Frost. Um, oh, yeah. Wilf, okay. Yeah. Wilf is just a fabulous dude. Um, back when I used to be able to go into the studio, Zub, he used to, uh, uh, he and I would meet each other up in the gym. CNBC okay. had its own gym. Um, now that I'm sure we're all locked out of, but I haven't been back in the studio, Zuby, for two years. Wow. Um, uh, I know Wilf has probably been there, and I know he's been at, the New York Stock Exchange, where he broadcasts from. But as you know, he is broadcast royalty. I mean, his father was David Frost, mm -hmm. uh, Sir David Frost. And uh, when he reached out to me and said, do you know Zuby? <laughs> and I said, no, but I'd love to. Can you introduce me? And he said, oh, sure, happy to. So he reached <laughs> out to you, Zuby. And he said, yeah, we, we studied at Oxford together. <laughs> <laughs> Again, things you never hear about a rapper. Oh, yeah, we studied at Oxford together. And he was a computer scientist. <laughs> uh, but folks, there's an awful lot you're going to hear about Zuby on the broadcast today, all of which is true. Um, and it's crazy how many things this gentleman has done um, in his relatively short life including amassing now, I think 620 or 640,000 followers on Twitter, that account yeah. that I mentioned, Zuby Music, as well as um, his Instagram following up over 300,000 or more. Um, wow, Zuby, you have just exploded. Um, and part of the reason I think is that people just really like how down to earth you are, how you're not full of BS, and how you kind of question um, some of the narratives that are out there in the media, the same way, again, that I do. Mm -hmm. um, but you even have a bigger audience now uh, of folks that when you offer a question uh, to the audience, it gets hundreds of thousands of responses. And I think that makes you a really important person. So again, Thank you with that big, long lead in Zoom. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me here today. Happy to be here, John. It's an honor. Thank you for the very kind introduction and kind words. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, first of all, first question, did you ever end up working as a computer scientist? Uh, uh, because I know that's what you studied at Oxford, <laughs> but then you sort of became a rapper partway through that, mm. which again, that's, that's a divergence in paths that most people would never come to <laughs> well i say that going to university is to open doors not to close existing ones mm -hmm. so could i do what i do without having gone to university yes absolutely 
But just because you've gone to university or because you've studied a certain subject, I don't think that means that you then are no longer allowed to be an artist or an actor or a creative or a chef or whatever the heck you want to do. Um, I think in life, it's always good to have options. And sometimes it's not until you get involved with something that you realize what you're truly passionate about and even find out where some of your talents lie and see what you really want to do in the world. So I actually started rapping when I went to Oxford. I started rapping in my first year of university and I released my first album in my second year of university. And so that was the sort of light bulb moment where I was like, okay, cool. This is something I, I can do. And people like my music and are willing to buy it and to come to my gigs and so on. So actually, after I graduated, I did my music full time for one year. And then I already had a job opportunity to work for a management consulting company in London. So I moved to London after that one year and I started working for them. I did that for three years while doing my music stuff on the side. Um, and then in November 2011, so just over 10 years ago now, I took the plunge and decided to become a full time musician and creator. And I've been self employed since that time, so over 10 years now. And 2019 was a big turning point. So I think the vast majority of people who know me now most likely discovered me in the past two and a half or years or so. And um, I mean, you, you were giving some numbers earlier to give you an idea across all my social media combined at the beginning of 2019, I had about 50,000 followers. That's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, everything combined. I had about 50,000 specifically on Twitter. I think I had about 17,000. Um, and then at this point, as we record this now, I think it's somewhere around 1.1 million across the board. And the Twitter has gone from 17,000 to 620,000 at the time of this recording. So that's just to give people an idea of number one, how long I've been at it all. I put out my first album in 2006. And then the the sort of trajectory that, that's gone on. So it hasn't been any kind of linear growth. It's been over a decade of planting seeds, you know, putting in crazy, crazy leg work, traveling all over the UK, touring in different countries, doing this, doing that, just hustling all nonstop to reach the stage I am now. So I think now a lot of people discover me through the internet, but prior to that, most people knew me just from my real world efforts, primarily here in the UK. And so I say that to number one, for anyone who's out there, who's an entrepreneur or creative or working at something, you know, you, you got to persevere. You got to keep putting in that work. You've got to keep planting those seeds and they will blossom later. Don't give up. Um, and then also just so people understand a little bit of the, of the journey as to how things have gotten where they are. And as far as I'm concerned, this is still the beginning of the story. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, um, an overnight success folks, <laughs> you know, the very <laughs> first thing he did superstardom was right there. <laughs> um, but, uh, do definitely pay attention to, uh, the fact that, uh, uh, for people that are willing to put in the work there is a reward there. Now, not all of us would attain Zuby's level of success in rap or music, um, but if you don't try, you're never gonna get anywhere. Um, I mean, and he is a testament to uh, both putting in the work and loving the work. Mm. Um, and it really is true. If you really love what you do, I love Zuby trading every day. I mean, I love <laughs> trading. I love talking about it. My brother and I are blessed to be able to talk about it on television um, and, you know, to meet people like yourself. Uh, it's a thrill. I mean, I, I don't just love meeting all the people I meet through CNBC that are traders and fabulous money managers. I mean, I've met a lot of great athletes, musicians, um, you know, filmmakers, uh, people in Hollywood and things like that. Just, you know randomly through CNBC, I've made those connections. Um, and it's been a delight. Uh, and uh, again, another parallel between you and I, I've lived, let's see, I've lived in Frankfurt, Germany, I've lived in London, I've lived in Paris, um, I've lived in San Francisco, Pittsburgh, um, San Diego, Minneapolis, and Chicago for, you know, the last basically 40 years. Okay. Um, but 
you have a real wander lust, uh, <laughs> especially during COVID when a lot of people were locked down. Um, you were traveling all over the place and I was doing the same. I just looked at my American miles the other day, Zoop. I have done 130,000 miles on American this year, wow. 80,000 miles on United, and then a few <laughs> thrown in here and there on private jets and things with That's friends. Crazy. <laughs> but I mean, you've been everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere in yeah, the last I don't think I've, I don't think I've racked up those. I definitely haven't racked up that kind of mileage though. I think I've been to, I think I've been to seven countries over the past, over the past 18, 18 months, two years. Mm -hmm. So I've been to obviously the UK, USA, Romania, Mexico, Turkey, um, Greece. And Love Greece. where am I missing? Portugal. Oh, yeah, Portugal is oh man, Portugal, dude. They they love they love the Rona out there. They love it. They love the Rona. Oh, oh my gosh. Say? Oh my gosh. It's exhausting there, man. It's exhausting. It's like 99% of people wearing their masks outside. It's nuts. And they scream at you if you don't join them. So, oh my. Um, yeah, yeah. I went there to escape the UK and then went out of the out of the uh what do they say? Out of the fire into the oven, or is it the other way around? Something like that. <laughs> Out of the frying um, pan into the fire. Yeah, yeah. You know? I don't know. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was weird there, and I don't think they've lightened up very much. But hey, what can you do? You know, it's amazing. Um, my friends in New York Zoo that uh, uh, I haven't talked to Wilf about it, but a lot of my friends in New York are still scared. Oh man! Right now they're scared, <sighs> um, and you know I try to tell them what life is like in the rest of the United States, except it's for California, so, except so for California. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I went out, uh, I was lucky enough to go out and do uh, Adam Carolla's show mm, out in mm. Glendale, California earlier this year. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty normal. Um, yeah. You had to wear mask when you went into a restaurant, but you know, they let you sort of, um, live a little bit of your life. It wasn't as locked down as New York. I know it did get worse. Mm -hmm. California did get worse. And, yep. you know, uh, it hasn't helped. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I was in the States, I went to 10 different States. Mm -hmm. So over the course of three months. So I really, I really ran the gamut of the different, uh, the, you know, I was in Texas, I was in Florida, I was in Tennessee. And then also I was in New York, California, Hawaii, Maryland, Maryland was probably the worst. Um, and yeah, it was, it was weird, man. People are just living in complete alternate realities. I think that's been happening for several years. And I think over the past two, that, that divide has just diverged even further. And honestly, people are just simply not occupying the same reality anymore. And so I'm not really sure what to do with that. I'm not really sure what to make of it. Um, mm -hmm. at this point, I'm just like, look, I think I've saved everyone who I'm going to save and I've red pilled everybody who I'm going to red pill. And <laughs> some people are simply not going to get it and perhaps don't want to. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm all for freedom of religion. So I, I've got my own religion already. I'm not trying to join the branch Covidian cult, but, um, if that's what some people need to find meaning and purpose and community in their lives, then, um, so be it as long as they leave me alone and them not wanting to do so tends to be the issue. Yeah. Well, in fact, one of the uh, one of the many things that uh, I, I found so unique in your view on Twitter was uh, that uh, you do interact a lot um, with your followers or with the people that are tweeting at you, which is good to see um, uh, someone of your stature that actually does interact, even with some of the haters. I mean, I saw one not too long ago that uh, I didn't know you were a Freemason. Um, oh yeah. Oh, just oh, neither did I until today. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> what, it's <a> dumb thing. <laughs> what, what people do is, like, if you're a rapper, people like to go on YouTube, and they freeze like certain clips where your hand is like in a certain in a certain way, and then they'll like draw lines over it and try to make it out that you're making some kind of uh, Illuminati symbols or something like that, and. Yep. Um, there's some strange people online, John. I mean, you, you, you know how it is, but there's some very weird, some very weird people out there. I always say the best and worst thing about social media is that everybody has a platform, you know, that's the best thing. And it's also the worst thing because 
yeah, I come across people on every day. I mean, I've been on, I've been on Twitter for 12 years and I still get surprised every single day. I, yeah. I still see, <laughs> I still see stuff every day where I'm just like, wait, is this, is this real? Like, is this a real person? Is this, are there people who think like this? Cause in the real world, I'm like, I don't know anyone who's this loony. And then I'm just like, oh, wow. Okay. This person is not joking. This is really their position and their belief. And it's, I think you have to laugh at it and you have to smile. Otherwise you just go insane. So I like to laugh all the way through things. I think perhaps, and, and perhaps this is something people value that I do beyond my, my, my authenticity and insight, I guess, is that I, I simultaneously take life seriously, but I also recognize that it's kind of a big joke and you have to laugh at it. Otherwise you kind of go nuts. And I think a big problem is that, how would I put it? I think people take jokes too. I think we live in a time where people take, uh, I don't know, how would I put this? I've never articulated this before. There are things that are obvious, obvious jokes or obviously jovial, which people take far too seriously and choose to be offended by and outraged by. And then there is also sort of the opposite where there's stuff that perhaps people should take more seriously, but it's not viewed with any seriosity or seriousness. Um, and there's this strange, but I, I don't know. I think you, you have to really balance life with being able to take it seriously enough to, to, to be successful and to have people understand you and respect you and get where you're coming from. But if you take everything too seriously all the time, then you just end up in this very negative mind state and you lose the ability to laugh at other things and yourself. And yeah, I, I don't know. You want to be red pilled, but not black pilled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I, I think one of the things, perhaps one of the many things that I saw that caused me to start following you and so forth was that, uh, um, and it was before I saw you on Rogan or any of, you know, Ben or any of the big podcasters that are certainly, you know, I know you have your podcast as well, and I'm, I'm sure it's exploding and I hope it's just tremendously successful um, because you know, having somebody that gets out there and says things like, um, has anybody noticed how many of these young footballers are collapsing on the pitch or something mm -hmm. like that? You know, those are things that people haven't really focused on or talked about. And if they do, they try to cancel us, <laughs> you know, for just pointing out something that I've never seen this many world class athletes having these kinds of issues. Now, some would say, well, it's COVID and others would say, well, it's the vaccine and so forth. But any kind of questioning of the narrative gets people in trouble, gets them hate. And that mob comes after you. They've come after me, come after anybody mm -hmm. who says anything about, um, you know, and, and full, full uh, disclosure, Zub, I have both the first two vaccines and because I'm traveling to Europe and I need to get into certain countries over there, I just got my booster two weeks ago. I've never had a reaction to any of them. Yeah. And yet I don't preach that everybody should go out and do it. Um, for me, it was a decision because I travel so much mm -hmm. that I decided after reading the, the things that I read that I could do this, even though I'm in a relatively low risk group, I'm double your age. Um, but nonetheless, you're not I'm double healthy. my age. <laughs> well, I think I'm double your age. <laughs> you're not I'm double 63. My age. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You're, you look younger than that to be fair. So well done. Okay. Well, thank okay. you. Double, double, eight, double my age would be 70. So, all right. So yeah, you're not, you're not, I, was like, I was like, this guy can't be 70. Surely not. <laughs> well, thank goodness I'm not yet, but I had nothing in, I mean, my dad was a doctor. My dad, my mom was a nurse. Mm -hmm. um, they always taught us to, that science was um, a critical examination of a hypothesis mm -hmm. and uh, skepticism, you know, that nobody in science takes everything at that value. They always want to be skeptical because that's what you do to prove that hypothesis to be real, mm -hmm. um, to be correct. Mm -hmm. And yet, no matter how many times I tell people, do you know, how, do you have any idea how big the coronavirus um, is in microns? 
and how big your mask would have or how effective your mask would have to be and to be applied correctly. Again, my dad was a surgeon. The sort of mask he wore was different in surgery than the sort that would protect you against COVID. Mm -hmm. His mask or my mom's mask would not protect them against COVID. It yeah. would keep whatever they might expel from going into a wound of a patient or into a kidney transplant patient's um, you know, open stomach or open cavity there, but it would not stop the COVID, you know, the one micron COVID particle from getting through that mask. Yeah. Only an N99 mask mm -hmm. applied properly would even come close to fulfilling that. And yet all these people are walking around, like you said, in Portugal, fully masked up everywhere on the street. If you don't do it, you want to kill your grandma. And, it's, you know, again, weird, it's man. just crazy. It's a mass psychosis, man. It's a mass psychosis. And, you know, I was having this discussion funnily enough earlier today with my parents, which is that, you know, we, we live in this time where people are stuck on black and white and binary thinking and false mm -hmm. dichotomies and believing that if you're not all the way on one end of something, you must be on the other end. If you're not pro something, you must be anti. If you're not anti, you must be pro. If you're pro, that must mean you want it to be forced. If you're anti, that must mean you want it to be banned, right? Everything is just black and white. And, you know, was it males who said that tyranny is the deliberate removal of nuance? Isn't that Very what well we're living through? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we're living through? Tyranny is the deliberate yep. removal of nuance. That's exactly what is going on right here. Right. So all through this thing, that's one of the funniest things about how, you know, a lot of people have been drawn to my commentary over the past two years. And my position is so has, has been so simple throughout. I've made no demands on anybody. My position has just been like, hey, your health is your responsibility. Um, you know, obviously people shouldn't be reckless, let alone go out and try to actively hurt, infect whatever other people, you know. Look, you you know what's I'm not going to sit here and lecture you, John, who is 28 years my senior, and tell you what is the what what are the best decisions that you can make for you and for your family and for this and that. I don't know your medical history. I don't know this. I don't know that. A lot of people don't know my. It's just like look, I I believe that you as an adult, <laughs> we've all made it this far. So I generally trust people to make decisions that are sensible for themselves, their families, their loved ones, people around them, et cetera. I don't think that everything needs to be forced and mandated and coerced. And all, I, all what freaks me out about the whole thing has been the, the coercion and the bullying and the lying and the shaming and the mandates and this and that. It's just like, look, I'm, I'm pro-liberty. Do what makes do what makes sense for you, right? I'm 35 years old. I'm in great shape. I've already had the Rona. I've got very strong natural immunity. There are other people who are 85 years old and they're, they've got four comorbidities and they haven't already had the event. Like the, the notion that, that we are in the same risk category and should therefore take the exact same actions, et cetera, is completely absurd, right? Let alone a, a five-year-old, right? We're living in this weird time where it's one size fits all. Let's treat six-year-olds the exact same way we're treating 86 year olds, even though we know and have known from very early that with this particular issue, that doesn't even make any sort of sense. There's been no balance between, okay, let's try to balance like people's civil rights and their liberties and their freedoms with um, health and safety, not just from this, but overall. And uh, let's look at the other aspects of physical health, mental health, like supplementation, diet, nutrition, weight loss, like all of these things, all these holistic things have just been completely jettisoned, completely jettisoned, ignored. If you talk about them, you're the bad guy, you're a conspiracy theorist, you're this, you're that, just all this name calling. And it's just exhausting. You know, I've talked about it far too much over the last two years. I think in 2022, I am mostly going to leave it in the dust, not entirely, because I'm always going to stand up for liberty and freedom. When I see that being, um, infringed upon and encroached upon but i, I think this thing is just uh you know it, it's been over for a long time in terms of the the real threat uh that's been you know it's, you're not going to go to zero here's another thing right and i think this is part of the binary thinking where people think that you can reduce things to zero you know people are behaving as if prior to 2020 nobody ever got sick or died you know we were all immortal prior to 2020 
And so this entire global freak out and this freak out that's happening in various cities in Europe, in, in, um, in America, here, there, like everywhere. It's just like, guys, people, people have just lost their minds. It's almost like people have forgotten. I, I, I think maybe people never really, and I think this is, here's a thought. I, I think that particularly in the modern Western world, I think that a lot of people have not really thought about their own perhaps and other people's mortality very much prior to this time. So I think that's one of the thick reasons for the, for the reaction, for the response. I think that people have been confronted with something that they see, okay, this is a threat. This is something that can kill other people, could potentially, you know, kill or make me sick. And it's just been put into their conscience so hard. And perhaps prior to this time, they never really thought about it. And so you're just having this huge overreaction to one particular threat where it doesn't really make sense from any sort of rational, logical, or numerical standpoint for the vast majority of people. I mean, if you are 25 years old and in decent health and you're, you've been terrified of this virus for the past two years, then, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Like it, it, it simply doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Right. Like, I mean, if you're, if you're 92 years old and you're in rough shape and it's like, okay, yeah, you know, maybe you don't want to get this thing and you want to take whatever necessary reasonable precautions. I understand that, but yeah, I, th I think a lot of what's been going on has been very, um, I think it's been all psychological based. I think it's brought up some very interesting sort of philosophical questions, which uh, haven't really been discussed or been answered. So as someone who's just a societal, cultural observer and commentator to some degree, both within and outside my music, it's been, it's been interesting. It's been interesting. It's been uh, disturbing, but I feel like I've had a, you know, a decades or two decades worth of human psychology <laughs> um, learned in a very short period of time. Yeah, well, um, uh, and folks, uh, talking with Zuby now, he is also an author of Strong Advice. Um, this is a, uh, a guide to fitness for everybody. Uh, my brother and I are huge believers in that, Zub. We both played awesome. pro football. My brother played six years. I played four games. <laughs> <laughs> Different football than you guys play in the UK, but nonetheless, um, uh, you know, you certainly look like a wide receiver or something like that. You know, these <laughs> the, the dude is shredded, folks. And you don't have to be Zuby or a pro athlete, but doing a little bit of exercise um, is probably the single biggest thing to keep the Rona away from you. I mean, uh, or making sure that you will uh, survive if Rona does hit you. It hit my brother Pete, um, mm -hmm. Zuby, it hit, um, you know, uh, uh, Aaron Rodgers. I mean, you know, you can go, people. yeah, lots. And how many athletes that were in good shape that were not vaccinated just came right back from it? You know, people like Aaron Rodgers, like you, Zub, mm -hmm. like my brother, Pete. Um, and yet people will just hunker down in their homes, even if they're not obese um, and not go out and get that workout that would make them um, uh, more resistant to uh, this disease. Because there's a couple things we know. One, vitamin D um, is really helpful against uh, in, in terms of getting your body, your immune system up to speed. Mm -hmm. There are a whole bunch of other things uh, that you could be taking other supplements and so forth too. But um, if you are one of the folks that is clinically obese, yes, you are more at risk than the rest of us. It's not me making fun of you or anything else. I hope you get yourself in shape if you're clinically obese because you'll have a better life, you'll live longer, um, and the Rona, you won't live in fear of the Rona, but you should live in fear if you're clinically obese, because that's one of the comorbidities mm -hmm. is that, you know, the people not just that for, have not just for not just for this one virus either for no. the things that are much bigger and more oh, yeah. kill you. Heart disease, mm -hmm. um, stroke, mm -hmm. type one, type two diabetes. I mean, you, go. you can go through a whole list of things yeah. that not being in shape. And again, we're not talking about being shredded like 50 cent 
or Zuby, <laughs> because the cover of his book, you look like 50. <laughs> you do, because he's shirtless on the cover of the book. Pull it up on Amazon, folks. Strong advice. It's not, um, it's not actually on Amazon, so pull it up. Oh, on it's not team, on Amazon? No, it's not on Amazon, no. Oh, pull it, pull it up I, on teamzuby.com. Teamzuby.com, which yeah, you, you can also one. get that hat that he's got. Or Sold out right now, but hoodies. you can get others. <laughs> he's got hoodies up there, folks. <laughs> Yes. I mean, he's he's a one man marketing machine. Yeah, I got the uh, the fully fully jaccinated hoodies, which are selling very well. So people fully like this. Yeah, I've been because of everything we've been talking about. I've I've started the you know get jaccinated campaign. So mm-hmm. encouraging people to you know go to the gym, take care of themselves, lose weight, get buff, get jacked, get vaccinated. So uh, yep. that message has been missing throughout. So I wanted to uh, to throw it in there because we need to talk about health more holistically. Uh, I see somebody from Eastleigh just bought a Team Zuby something or other oh, on nice. your website. It just <laughs> popped up. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, definitely, folks, uh, you'll feel better about your life. You'll sleep better if you pay a little more attention to your health and a little less attention to CDC guidelines and all the rest. <laughs> we could talk about that all day, but yeah. the uh, Zuby's got a lot more interesting things to say than just about the Rona. Um, and by the way, uh, I've mentioned this before on the broadcasts, but I went to high school with Prince. Um, I knew Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis as well. These are a couple big producers. Uh, they did Janet Jackson's, um, what was that? 18 something. Shoot, I forget the name. The, her big breakout album, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis were the guys in Minneapolis that that she wanted to uh, um, change up her style a little bit. And they're the ones that uh, helped her do that. Okay. And uh, But they said, look, we're not coming out to California. You're going to have to come up here, um, up <laughs> to Minnesota. And Prince said one of the reasons he lived in Minnesota Zoob was he said the cold keeps the bad people away. <laughs> <laughs> but what a what a wonderful guy he was. Um, whenever I mention that, and it's probably the closest I've been to crying on air. Um, when he died, mm. and then they asked me right after the show, we heard about it as I was finishing my part of my broadcast, Zoom. And then uh, they mentioned that he had passed. And they said, hey, John, can you stick around and talk to us about knowing Prince and blah, blah, blah. Okay, sure. But then you start recalling those memories and things, and it kind of hits you mm-hmm. that, that he's gone. But what a, what a talented dude, very quiet, mm-hmm. um, at least when I knew him. he was. I know he's a huge showman, but he was a really quiet guy, um, very slight. Um, I think with platforms, he was probably 5'8". Mm. or five nine with a platform like that (laughs) um but what a talent and Mm. uh he used to entertain we'd have uh they called them assemblies where people would just come to the uh uh, to the theater and on fridays like twice a month we'd have an assembly and uh i got bussed into a primarily black school zoo so I was going to an all-white school, all-white neighborhood, blah, 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 uh, when I lived in Minneapolis. I grew up in San Francisco for the longest time, moved to Minneapolis when I was 12. Um, and then, you know, the first four or five years, I was in almost lily-white schools. And then I got bust into the center city, Minneapolis, and it was completely mm-hmm. different. Then I was in the big minority. There was only one other black, uh, white guy on the football team <laughs> and things like that. But um, we used to have entertainment on, uh, on the uh, uh, Fridays and it would be, half the time it would be people getting up on stage and just dancing to music, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, is something I wasn't used to seeing at the schools that I grew up at. Um, but all of a sudden, you know, there'd be a bunch of kids that would come out and they'd all be dancing and things like that. <laughs> and, you know, incredible dance moves. Um, and then Prince, you know, the curtain would open and there'd be Prince and he'd just be playing. And every time he'd be playing something different wow. uh, because he played horns, he played drums, he played uh, guitar. And I think the only instrument that he took lessons on was the drums. Um, okay. I believe that's what he said. But anyway, 
huge talent. And uh, yeah, still miss him. Uh, my brother Pete used to actually go over to uh, Paisley Park where he'd have parties. Mm. Um, but you couldn't bring drink and you couldn't bring drugs. It was, you know, he was, yeah, he was against all of that. Um, and yet the poor guy, because of, um, I think, being very animated on stage um, and, you know, all those years wearing platform shoes and so forth, he had really bad hips. He needed mm. a hip transplant. And I believe that was why he was on the drugs that he was on. Mm -hmm. um, because it wasn't recreational drugs, they were for pain. And ultimately, sadly, I think it's one of the things that took him down. Yeah. Um, so pretty sad about that. But uh, gosh, uh, definitely an interesting uh, uh, change in my life. Mm. When all of a sudden, we went from one, uh, you know, being the majority to being the extreme minority. <laughs> and then, you know, you go off and you play sports both in college and pro and it's much closer to 60 40 probably black athletes to white athletes mm. um, black athletes seem to dominate in virtually every uh, of the major sports in america um and uh you know those are your best friends you know the people you play football with just like being in the military mm -hmm. are the guys that you're willing to do whatever um, because, you know, they're your pals there, you yeah. know, so you get a bond that is uh, very exceptional um, with that. Did you play sports when you yeah. were young, Zoop? Yeah, most definitely. Younger. You're still <laughs> younger. Young. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when I was in Saudi Arabia, I used to primarily play um, football, what Americans call soccer and um, baseball. And then because I was in the American schooling system up until fifth grade out in Saudi Arabia. Then when I moved to the UK for boarding school, when I was 11, I started playing rugby. I kept playing football as well. And um, I, I, I dabbled in some, I, I, I've done a bunch of other sports. I've been on a swimming team before. I've done, um, I've done athletics. I've done, I've done rowing. I've done cricket. I've done hockey. I've done, I've done a big range of different sports, but rugby was my primary sport. I played that all the way through university. Um, I played for, for my, my college when I was in university. And then after that, I just kept up with going to the gym. Um, but I haven't done competitive sports for over 10 years now. It's been a while since I've done any competitive sports, but I just keep my training up. I like to stay in shape. I like to stay in strong, stay fit. There's no downsides to that. There's infinite upsides, um, not just for the short term, but for the long term as, as we've already, as we've already discussed. And so yeah, that's for me now. But yeah, I played rugby for t for 10 years. So that was my main sport. Um, I thought this one was interesting too. this quote by you. Uh, the modern education system won't teach you how to make a lot of money, but it will teach you to resent people who make a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, with Team <laughs> Zuby, and this is a shameless plug, you know, for his, his shop folks. If you go to teamzuby.com, You'll see, you know, the book, Strong Advice. You'll be able to go there and uh, uh, get jaxed, <laughs> all that cool <laughs> gear and all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, again, we've already discussed how this didn't just happen in the flash. Uh, this Definitely. is something that you've been building over time um, is a business. And obviously your podcast feeds into this and so forth. But why do you think schools teach people to resent people who make a lot of money? Well, look, I'm not going to say that it's, it's every school. Of course not. When I tweet things, I tend to put things a little bit more, you know, you can only get so much nuance into a, into a one or two sentence tweet, but I like to uh, start conversations and set ideas. But I think that, hmm, you know, I, I think number one is that, the way the schooling and education system is, is I think it's actually pretty outdated in a lot of ways. I think that it doesn't set people up for success in the modern and future world anywhere near as well as it could. It's still kind of based on that model as if everyone's going to go off and work in a factory, right? It might even, even when it comes to university level, everything's always about getting a job and seeking employment rather than encouraging any form of entrepreneurship or starting a company or general 
financial literacy, investing, all these types of things that actually are extraordinarily important and which you may not realize how important they are until you get out there in the real world. I mean, take something as simple as as investing, right? Just the concept of investing both in yourself and also your finances. Just that, like if you take two people, I mean, one of them learns about investing at 18 and the other one doesn't learn until he's, you know, if he ever learns, he doesn't learn until his, his 40s or his 50s or his 60s, then that's going to create a gigantic potential gap between those people. Um, you could even take two people who are literally on the same salary, have the exact same earnings, but one of them is investing a percentage of his salary every year for a period of several decades, and the other is not. And even if they're quite diligent with saving, as you know, through the power of compounding interest, that, that gap will just grow to an extraordinary amount to the tune of you know seven or perhaps even, even eight figures, depending on how much is, is being invested and what's being invested in. So I think that there are some very core lessons that are really important, which are just glossed over by the school system. And then I do think that you now, and it's been like this for a while, but you also have certain schools which are really more about activism and indoctrination and pushing ideology more than they really are about trying to give children a holistic and useful education that they can then use to be of service to other people. Because ultimately, and again, most people don't really think about the world like this, but all the economy is, all a job is, all a career is, all we're, we are all just exchanging goods and services with each other. That's, that's all we do, right? If someone is making a lot of money, it's because they are providing a lot of economic value to somebody, their employers, their customers, their clients. That's just what it is, whether you are a musician or a plumber or a broadcaster, or a podcaster, or a dancer, or an electrician, we are all just exchanging goods and services with each other. You have something of value that you offer, someone is willing to pay money for that. That's all it is. And I think people don't even, I guess people realize it implicitly, but they don't really explicitly understand like, look, that, that's how simple the world is. You want to make more money, then you add more value to more people's lives. You, you help more people. You offer a good or a service whether independently or self-employed or employed or whatever, you, you bring more value to the table and, oh, wow, okay, more money comes through that. So I think that people's general understanding of just some of these basic concepts and economics and finance, what, what, what even is money? When we, when we say money, what does, what does that even mean? What, what is money? Is it just pieces of paper? Is it numbers on a screen? Is it this? Is it that? Where does its value come from? Why can't we just throw trillions and trillions of dollars into the economy and that is okay. Why can't we just pay everyone a $50 minimum wage? And just, you know, there's people who think that you just say, hey, just, pay. that's how you fix it, right? Just pay everyone $50 minimum wage and it's all good. And the fact that you can have like a grown adult who doesn't understand the implications of that is pretty crazy to me. But then again, a lot of people don't understand that if you eat more calories than you burn, then you gain weight. Or if you burn more calories than you eat, then you lose weight. Like there are some, I, I think that to core areas, and we've, we've already touched on them, that are completely missing and just absent in a lot of schooling is looking after your, your, your body and your health. This includes nutrition, exercise, um, you know, even you guess some aspects of what you could consider mental health, which is connected to physical health. And then just like money and finances. I, I think that those two areas, because no matter what you do in the future, if you're a child and you're in school, no, no matter what you go on to do in the future, you're, you're absolutely going to need to know how to manage money because you're going to deal with money. That's just the thing. We all deal with money, whether you like it or not, or you're indifferent, we all have to deal with money. And we also all have to deal with every day we eat and we choose to move. And so we all also have one body and we need to look after our bodies. So no matter what you do, you're going to have to deal with health, fitness, and nutrition and you're going to have to deal with money and finances, period. Like those, that's just part of being an adult. If you have a family, that's going to multiply and so on. And it's crazy how many people go, you know, graduate, even graduate from college, you can even graduate with a PhD and still be completely uneducated and clueless about those areas. And 
that's pretty bananas to me. You know, you might know all about trigonometry and photosynthesis, and you can differentiate between a brontosaurus and a triceratops, but you can't, <laughs> but you don't know, <laughs> but you know, how does, how do taxes work? How does a mortgage work? What's APR? What's API? Why? What is compound interest? What is a, what's an index fund? What is a, this? What's that? Like just basic things, you know, what is a calorie? What's the difference between a carbohydrate and a protein? Right. What's the difference between right. like people don't know the, these real simple things. And, and that, that's not, you know, and people can be very, very bright and even supposedly educated and still just be missing out on these things. So I, I don't know. I have a conspiracy theory that it's not by accident that these things are not taught. I think it's intentional, but um, I think people who go out of their way to learn them or have the benefit of learning them from other people from relatively young, be it parents or anybody else, then that's always going to give you a big advantage. So that's a very long-winded answer to your question there. No, that's great. Um, as you know, uh, Pete and I are all about investing. We're about helping people. Um, yes, we're about making money too. Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. Nothing wrong um, with it. You know, uh, my, what, what, what Zuby described, folks, um, what we get for the work that we put in is we have less time uh, in other words, I've exchanged my time, my expertise to give somebody something. And for that, the exchange is I'm getting money or some form of remuneration. Um, that's the way the world works. And so when we're out there uh, uh, looking at opportunities in the market and when we're citing those, um, we get to do that on television and tell people about, oh, this stock or that stock this option or that option. It's fun. Our skin is in the game. We always have to disclose that, by the way, Zub, when we're on television, people like Wilfred can't trade. And mm. he's a smart man, but it's mm. not that he can't figure it out. He can invest, but he has to hold things by the rules at CNBC. Mm. I think it's 90 days. So okay. whatever he buys, he has to hold it for 90 days. Same thing with everybody, except those of us that are either guests or panelists that we can trade. And I trade multiple times, you know, mm. dozens of times a day. Mm. Um, and I don't just trade stock and options. I trade crypto, which I'll ask you about in a sec. But um, I know that you, to fund your business, um, you went out in, in, for instance, with the world of Zuby, one of the um, it was what album number five or something like that. No, number five? six. That was the album six? I put out this year. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you funded that um, on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I think it was either one of the, the most successful fundings of a rap album ever, or certainly the most successful funding of one online in the UK. I can't remember for yeah, sure. It was so the top, top one in the UK, most funded. UK based hip hop project in, 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 in the UK ever. Um, and I think even outside the UK on a global level on Kickstarter, it was, I can't remember what rank now, but I think it was in the top, I want to say in the top 20. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in the top 10 music projects overall in the UK, something like that, I need to, I need to go back and check. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I did a crowdfunding project on Kickstarter and it raised over, raised over 75,000 pounds, hundred thousand dollars in, in 30 days, which is, um, a testament to my audience and my supporter base and just how much people wanted to back that and, and support it. I mean, that's, that's crazy. Like that, as I say that number again, now I'm just like, geez, like that's, that's a lot. Um, and so I'm, I'm honored, but again, you know, it's, it's been 15 years of grind to, to get to that stage. I mean, I did a Kickstarter project in for my 2018 album and that one raised about 15,000 pounds in the same period of time. So 15,000 pound, that's about, about 20, about $24,000. So you're talking more than quadruple, um, between, you know, three years between the two projects. So you know, I've got, I've got an amazing support base. That's one thing is, you know, we, we often get hung up on vanity metrics, especially as, as creators and as artists and just like, look, Hey, I've got a million followers. Awesome. But one thing that I care about a lot, and I know that my, my followers and my supporters see this is 
I, I care about the depth of the relationship, right? It's not just about me having a lot of followers. It's like, cool. I want people who actually care about what I do and who like what I do and who respect me and also who I like and who I respect. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who don't like their own audiences. <laughs> there are a lot of people out there, including celebrities, who, including musicians, who don't really like their own audiences. And I feel super blessed, but also I have done this, I've developed this very intentionally where I'm careful to cultivate an audience that I actually like and that I respect. So, and so that, that channels, cause one thing I'm big on is just authenticity. So I'm not good at being fake. Like if, if I don't, <laughs> if, if I don't, you know, I, 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 I just can't, I can't be fake. I have to be me. I have to, I have to keep it a hundred. And I'm also very happy to like call my followers. Like I call followers from my account every single day. Like I will, re I remove people from my account. I remove followers intentionally from my account. Um, like I'll literally go on someone's profile, I'll be like, like remove, remove this follower. I don't want this person even following me because I, I want to cultivate a certain audience. Like it's very open. It's very welcoming. But if people are just there to like, you know, be annoying or be aggressive or be insulting or attack me, attack my fans, just like this bad energy, you know, like, I don't, I don't need that. I don't respect it. I don't like it. It's just disruptive. Um, and I don't care for that. And because of the way I am, I, I attract a very, I, ha I think I truly have one of the most, people like the, the buzzword diversity these days. I think I truly have one of the most diverse audiences out there, like in the truest sense of diversity, because I'm very open-minded. You know, I have, I have my principles and I'm pretty outspoken on a lot of stuff and, you know, people agree, disagree, whatever, but I'm very open. Like I, I never, like one of my big social media rules is that I never block someone for a, I never block someone for a disagreement, never political disagreement, religious disagreement, disagreement. I, I, ne I never do that. Right. I like, if someone is like, you know, threatening or slandering or being like super unnecessarily insulting or whatever block, get rid of them. Right. But if it's just like, Oh, this person disagrees with me. Cool. No problem. Let's talk. Right. Let's talk. Let's, let's discuss. That's, that's what I'm about. So I, I cultivate that. And I like to start, I like to put questions out there and start conversations and just let people talk to each other and engage and, I like to say that I don't like to tell people what to think, but I want people to think. Yeah. Well, so I'm not going to, yeah. Right. Like I'm not going to tell you exactly, look, this is exactly what you must believe and you must subscribe to every view I have, whatever I'll say, Hey, look, this is what I think about this thing. Or I'll just ask questions, but Hey, like we're, we're going to reach different conclusions. We don't all have the same experiences, same perspectives. We're all different. We're all unique, whatever it is. Here's what I think. And here's why I believe it. I'm open to being challenged. I'm open to being questioned. I'm also going to ask questions. I'm going to discuss. I, ca I can't get into a heated debate with every single one of my followers every day because I have a life to live. Um, yep. But hey, like, let's put this out there. Let's chat. Let's see what you think. I try to explain things in a way that I think makes sense. And I try to be quite <laughs> articulate and concise. And I think, I think I can explain why I believe what I believe pretty well, whether someone agrees or disagrees. Um, and I'm also, look, I'm, I'm also just trying to get to the truth, John. This is one thing I'm trying to do. I'm simply just trying to understand the world better. I'm trying to understand the human experience. I, I, have, I have a lot of confidence in th some things, but I'm also humble enough to recognize that there are, you know, everybody has knowledge out there that I can learn from. Um, I think one of the best ways to stay grounded is to understand that everybody is superior to you in some way, right? Everybody knows something that you don't, has experiences that you don't, has insights that you don't. So, you know, each individual, one of us, sure, we all, we all have our, our skill sets and our backgrounds and our field of knowledge and expertise, but there's also stuff that like we're freaking clueless on. Like, you know, like there's stuff I don't, I don't absolutely nothing on, right? I'm seeing those trading uh, charts in the back. Like, you know, I invest, I, I don't know how to trade. Right? I don't know how to trade. Like if someone's putting up all these red and green candles in front of me and it's like <laughs> talking about, you know, cups and handles and, you know, like mm -hmm. all these, I, I'm like, I have some very, very basic knowledge, but like, I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh no, 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 you're wrong. Like, this is what it is. It's like, no, I will shut up and I will just listen and be like, okay, 
let me uh, understand this. And then there's other things where I'm like, okay, look, I can teach you about this thing. So, you know, um, and that, that, again, that's, that's just the way the world works. And I think that, um, I think there's quite a few things we're missing in the world at the moment. And I think, uh, I think humility is actually a big one. I think the humility and the willingness to say, I don't know, to not have an answer for everything, to be willing to change one's mind when prevented, presented with new information or new insight. Um, and I, I think we actually have a lot of problems because too many people are unwilling to do that. And that goes for politicians, that goes for people in the media, that goes for you know everyday people on the street even. Um, but I think that when that example is kind of set and that's what people see, then it sort of makes it harder for us to reconcile and heal certain divides and have empathy for each other and just, just be able to coexist and understand each other. I think that's a big problem, particularly in the USA. Um, and I think that's a big reason for increased polarization and division is simply people not willing to come to the table, break bread together, talk, you know, just talk, talk as human, human beings <laughs> and try to see where each other are coming from and have some compassion and some empathy and all of that. And I think the more that, the more that people can do that, then um, the more the world will actually move forward. Well, uh, let me wind it up by asking you a quick question about crypto. You did a, a great job talking about cup and handle and you know the charts <laughs> behind us and all that kind of stuff. But crypto, number one, have you ever invested it or traded uh, a cryptocurrency? Only for four years. Yes. Nice. Yep. Nice. And 2017. you believe in it. So we, we started about the same time. Yeah, so time. you believe in it. <laughs> More than. More than. I, yep. <laughs> No, no, I, I love it. I might have um, more crypto than I have yet, but I can't confirm nor deny. <laughs> well, I love it. Um, and uh, do you also invest in uh, a lot of the protocols, a lot of the Solana? You don't have to name them necessarily, Zub, but Solana, Hedera, um, Litecoin, Filecoin, Ethereum, or are yeah. you just with the biggest of the big, you know, with the Bitcoin? Yeah, so I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, which upsets Nor some, am I. some Bitcoin maximalists. I'm I, like I'm about seventy percent Bitcoin and thirty percent other stuff. Um, yeah, that's kind of my personal allocation. So to me, Bitcoin is Bitcoin, and I don't think that anything really competes with it nor rivals it. Um, but I don't think that I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's the only thing that has any value in the space, right? A lot of Bitcoin maxis think that, you know, anything that's not Bitcoin is either a scam or it's totally inferior. It has no purpose whatsoever. I, I, I don't, I don't agree with that again. Again, it's too black and white for me. Like I'm, I'm not, I don't like the whole black and white thing, you know, Bitcoin or nothing, you know, to me, it's like, mm -hmm. look, I can, to me, like Bitcoin is, you know, the whole digital gold thing is a little bit of a cliche, but it's like, look, there's tons of, there's lots of different types of metals out there, right? There's lots of different types of metals, but we recognize gold is, gold is gold, right? You can't mm -hmm. just give someone copper or tin or aluminum and be like, hey, well, it's also a metal. Like, it's, you know, it's like, look, Bitcoin to me is the gold standard of cryptocurrency. Um, it's the most decentralized, limited to 21 million. The, you know, it hasn't, doesn't have a, a, a CEO or a team behind it, et cetera. Um, so even something, you know, the number two, Ethereum, I think Ethereum has a purpose and it has, it has value and it's got things that it's better at and things that it's not going to supplant Bitcoin in. Um, and a lot of stuff is built on top of it, which you can't say is the case for Bitcoin. So to me, these things can coexist. You know, some people will be like, no, Bitcoin and Ethereum cannot coexist, right? Ethereum is going to go to zero. It's got to die. And I'm like, look, you know, Entitled to that opinion, but it's not my personal position. So um, I, I'm I'm big on Bitcoin, uh, and that's my main that's my main holding. But um, I think there's other interesting projects and platforms out there as well, which are also going to make their own mark in different ways. You've also got all the virtual reality projects coming out now. You've got the gaming projects. You've got various different blockchains. You mentioned Solana. Of course, you've got Ethereum, you've got, uh, you know, Cardano, whatever that properly materializes, Polygon. I mean, there's there's a lot out there, which I think have promise. So it'll be exciting to, to see where it all goes. I think I think it's still a very early stage. 
I agree. And I applaud you for being in it uh, since 2017. Yeah. Believe it or not, <laughs> yet another reason that we're brothers separated by birth. Uh, <laughs> although 28 years apart, so that was long gestation. <laughs> Zub, I can't thank you enough. I'm going to be respectful of your time. Um, I appreciate you coming on, sir. Um, remember, folks, you can go over to Team Zuby uh, to see any of the merchandise we've talked about here, whether it's hoodies, whether it's beanies, um, his strong advice book, uh, the album. It's all up there. TeamZuby.com. Zuby, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. I look forward to meeting you in person someday. Nice one, John. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Take care.